as you observed, there is a shift. I mean, the Vedas seem to be um, you know, a snapshot of a particular moment in Indian history where uh, what appear to be new <laughs> ideas um, starting to be described uh, because they, uh, first of all, have a link to ideas we find elsewhere, particularly in Persia, um, and perhaps even further back into Central Asia. Um, so the theory, which is pretty well substantiated by all sorts of things, uh, DNA evidence, linguistic evidence, is that some people migrated into India at that time. They weren't you know, the original inhabitants. Um, and they had chariots and horses, <laughs> and they talked about you know, warfare in a certain way. The, the Vedic hymns are very similar to the earliest uh, Persian texts in their description of the nature of the ritual, the deities themselves, um, you know, and what goes on. So there's obviously some connection there. Uh, and yeah, that is not sort of non-Indian. Um, the Vedas were composed in India, and they have you know, a particular connection to the place that they are you know, associated with. Um, yeah, but they're not yeah. unique. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, and so Indians have been trying to explain that sometimes in terms of everything having originated in India a lot earlier than you know, scholarship today would suggest, and then spread west from there. Unfortunately, there isn't the same weight of evidence to support that worldview. <laughs> I don't think we can say for certain that we can prove it's not true. We can't prove very much about the ancient past, but um, I do think we can say there's a substantial body of evidence that people migrated into India. They referred to themselves as Arya, uh, which means noble, um, and that's where we get this, this concept of the Aryans. Now, that's all been polluted in the Western mind by the fact that the Nazis borrowed all these ideas to yes, claim that yeah, they, yeah, they were the yeah. ultimate Aryan oh. master race. And there's, there's, no, there's no, no trace of that in early Hindu teachings. The Nazis have bastardized a lot of things, including the swastika, um, which you know, comes from the Sanskrit language. It just means you know, a symbol of goodness or auspiciousness. Mm. No, nobody these days thinks of it that way, unfortunately. Slightly but ironic. Um, yeah, well, before we get um, in Asia. Yeah, <laughs> into more contentious ground in the BGP after you, um, oh. I'm not going to get you into talking <laughs> about the Brahma Samaj or anything like that currently today. But um, I'm just going to go back actually to to our, our basic bedrock of trying to understand the sim simple terms of like what does it mean to to follow Shiva to be a Shaiva and what does it mean to uh, follow Vishnu and you know and indeed does anyone does anyone follow Brahma right? Um, is there any, you know, is there any Brahma followers? And I think before we start, maybe, you know, for, for our listenership, I think just it's a, it's a useful qualification you make in your book between Brahma and Brahman, you know, which actually I have to say, like, foiled me for a number of years where I didn't think that they were the same thing. But, uh, you know, well, actually, so I think it's Sanskrit, useful. To... You, you, you can often see them, particularly in compound written identically and so it can okay. be, especially well, in texts well. like the Mahabharata very difficult to differentiate between the reference to a deity um, who is sort of associated with the creation of everything um, and the concept that we get in the Upanishads of Brahman which is the totality of the cosmos really um, and I think you know the, the the idea of Brahma as a deity, or literally in Sanskrit, it should be pronounced Brahma. There's a long A at the end uh, with a line across the top when transliterated into English. Um, so they would be you know, enunciated differently. It'd be Brahma, the deity, and Brahman would be the word for the, the totality of everything. Um, and so the, the, the sound of it already indicates something other. Um, and one is uh, not really worshipped uh, in the way that you described uh, Shiva and Vishnu as being. You'll find temples mm. to Shiva and Vishnu all over India. Um, I mean, it's probably you know, also a lot of a lot of sites of worship of the goddess, although she doesn't have quite so many you know, grand um, bits of architecture <laughs> constructed for her. Um, but then, you know, Brahma, you don't find Brahma temples <laughs> um, no. in, the, in, in the same way. Um, and I think this is partly because... Um, Brahma is a bit of a sort of late stage invention of the concept anyway. The original creator deity from the Vedas is Prajapati, um, who is the Lord of Beings, is what his name means. Um, and uh, in some ways, you know, he, he, he sacrifices himself to make the world exist. And so there's this association in the way that the act of creation sort of involves that. Um, I mean, Vishnu is traditionally uh, depicted reclining on the cosmic serpent and to create the world, he sort of bursts an, uh, a lotus out of his navel, out of which comes Brahma, who brings the world into being. So he sort of sits outside of the cosmos, making it happen. Um, he's not present in it in the same way. Uh, whereas Vishnu in Sanskrit, it means all pervading. Um, and most of the philosophies of uh, you know, devotion to Shiva uh, 
are based on the fact that Shiva is all pervading as consciousness, particularly in the tantric descriptions of it. Um, so they're very much in the world, of the world, the world is made of them, <laughs> both Shiva and Vishnu, the whole sort of theology around uh, you know, their worship, and the goddess particularly also. Uh, whereas Brahma, it's, not, it's much more abstract in that sense. Whereas the concept of Brahman is the link yep. between all of these different religious traditions. That's the yeah. earliest expression of it in the Upanishads in a way that isn't necessarily what scholars would call theistic, associated with any god. Um, it's just the totality of, of everything. It's what we might call in New Age language, the universe. <laughs> and uh, these deities, they are also the universe. So they might be represented as the para Brahman, the supreme Brahman, that which is you know, beyond the beyond. Non-dual versions of, of philosophy, particularly Advaita Vedanta, will say, actually, it's the other way around. The supreme Brahman has no form. Um, these deities, you know, sure, they are embodiments of the totality, but they're stepping stones to a higher realization. Whereas the, the more dualistic uh, devotional religions that say, you know, I am separate to God, I have to bow down before, <laughs> they will see it as uh, you know, actually the deity is the highest. And uh, that's a distinction. But the Brahman concept that it is just absolute, <laughs> total, supreme, uh, above and beyond, um, that concept is, is, is sort of get the, the glue that binds mm, it all together. Mm. And do we find specific kind of qualities in those that take Shiva as their god and those that, you know, are invested in Vishnu? I mean, can we draw any lines and can we attach them at all to that? I, I want you to talk a little bit next on this little this little gallop through history about the, uh, the Darshanas, you know, and, and the schools, the different schools of perspective uh, we find. I mean, you know, is there any way to link Shaivism and Vaishnavism with uh, with certain perspectives of the darshanas, or uh, is that um, is that I too much? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, those darshanas, these sort of philosophical schools, as it were, um, they can mm. be a bit misleading in themselves. I mean, they're often portrayed as the six of the classical ones, um, but they were only really systematized you know, under a thousand years ago. <laughs> and I don't oh, I think I thought I thought they were classical. People systems. say people say there were a couple hundred. Like was again like a like a more of a British invention than in, in kind of like 1800s. They go back uh, further. There's, yeah, I mean, the 12th century, I think, is the earliest identification oh, okay. of these, these particular schools as, you know, the Orthodox six, um, and they're Orthodox. Right. Being, they, don't, they don't challenge the Vedas in the same way that the Buddhists, for example, did, said that the priests, you know, were, were corrupt and this ritual's pointless. <laughs> you just need to sit down and see through your illusion, as the Buddhas take. Um, so there are many other schools as well that don't get included in that list. Um, and there was a, a text written maybe 600 years or so ago, uh, the Sarva Darshana Sangra, it's called. So the collection of all, the compendium of all philosophies. And I think there's something like 14 or 16, I forget exactly in there. Um, and that includes some of the tantric religions that also get left out because they, they in a way contradict the Vedas by saying that they've got new, higher revelations, which might come from Shiva, might come from the goddess, might come from Vishnu. Um, so they're all a bit different, and, and in that sense, um, almost you know, there are new ways of seeing. Darshana comes from the bubble root uh, to see. Um, mm. So there are mm. ways of seeing the world, um, and therefore, you know, every every kind of religious school has its own way of seeing. In that sense, you know, they are closely correlated to particular deities, um, but actually, in the sense that we know that yoga. Vedanta, Sankhya, and then the ones that we don't really look at so much in the <laughs> world, Nyaya, Vaisheshika. And uh, I've forgotten what I missed out now. Where did we go? Yoga, Sankhya. Oh, the uh, Mimamsa. The Mimamsa. Uh, Mimamsa. Mimamsa. Um, looking at the yeah. Ritual. I perhaps confuse things too quickly there. I mean, let's go and go back to, I mean, can we draw any broad strokes between um, the, the worship of, of, of Shiva and Vishnu? I mean, if we look at, the, can, can we say that, that Vishnu is more bhakti based or more kind of um devotionally oriented um whereas uh, shape is mean, more of a more of the yogic you often see you know you don't see many vaishnite -like yoga practitioners it's more when you when you look at the sadhus well. they're generally more following <laughs> versus the shiva i may yeah, maybe wrong i'm just I've got a nice book here I highly recommend if okay to di dive in called uh, sadhus holy men of india by uh, there's a dutch guy dolf hartsauker who's he's a, a photographer and um, but he's also you know, quite knowledgeable spent you know, a couple of decades hanging out with sadhus and there's lots of uh, photographs and you can see from their various you know kind of head markings mm, that, uh, mm, mm. there are plenty of, of vaishnavas as well as shaivas in there right um, so i mean here's an example you might you know, if you, if you see the 
the head markings there, you might recognize those on, on Krishna Macharya, yeah. <laughs> who yeah. was himself yeah. a devotional yeah. Vaishnava. Um, so mm. Vaishnavism has had a very big influence on, on modern postural yoga practice. Krishna Macharya was a Vaishnava, BKS Iyengar also. Um, but Tubby Joyce, no. So there's a distinction there. Um, but I think I think actually, you know, in terms of uh, whether or not they are you know, particularly associated with either yoga or devotion, it really depends on which flavor, <laughs> because there are many. They don't they, you know, they don't lend themselves to easy categorization. Um, it's often talked about as if you know there's, 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 there's one type of tantric philosophy. It's non-dual. It's all about Shiva. It's, the cosmos is all sort of one energetic substance. But actually, the, the sort of mainstream and earliest sort of strand of tantric religion was quite dualistic. It was very similar to the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. Tamil Nadu, the, 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 the Shaivas of, of that part of the world, basically a bit like you know, Hare Krishna is going around singing love songs to God, um, but to Shiva. Mm. Um, so there's a whole tradition of, of very similar things in both categories. Um, right. I actually think they're just, they're just two different ways of talking about something very similar. So really we can't find particular, like a particular differences in approach there. In, in well, they are of, different, and you yeah, know, they, they, right. they have their own you know, qualities and flavours in the way that they present things. Um, but I don't think that they are of you know, such a different order that uh, they couldn't be reconciled. You can actually find parallels of any particular quality that you might associate with one of them in the other. So it makes it hard to differentiate them in that way. And I think this mm. is, you know, as, as, as most Hindus would, would probably describe it, and this goes back to the Rig Veda, there's a verse in there that says, you know, um, in reference to the particular early Vedic deities like uh, Indra and Agni, um, that uh, you shouldn't really see any of these as the totality in and of themselves. Behind them is this ultimate oneness. So they're just different portals back into the ultimate oneness. And I think for that reason, in particular, nobody would ever try and suggest that they're sort of utterly distinct and completely different. Um, they, they just have a slightly different feel to them. Um, and there's a concept in, in Indian religion, Ishta Devata, the, 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 the form of the divine that calls you, really, <laughs> that uh, you're drawn to. Um, that uh, is, is your way into that bigger picture. Um, and so there's always this, uh, again, ability to fold it all back into something you know, much more inclusive. Um, so even when there's apparent contradiction, it can be reconciled, but actually a lot of the time there isn't contradiction. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, India is often very confusing in this way, um, and it, it's yes. sometimes helpful to have yeah. that in a kind of overview to, to, to realise why it's confusing, how things do fit together. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we can't, inhabit all perspectives at once to pick whichever one is of interest to us and go mm. further with it but but you know not to think that's the only way of seeing i think is, is really the key mm. and um you, may, you mentioned a term earlier uh dualism i mean how how would that i mean you find i suppose you find dualism and non-dualism within both strands of shavism and, and vaishnism um and uh yeah. so we can't make that dis distinction either although i would still say surely that the the, the, the Shaivism is would be more advaita inclined than than other and and well, I mean, perhaps more more dualistic. But I don't want to stake any claims of that. It, it, in some context, so before you go down yeah. that route, before you go down that route, and I'm not cutting off because I'm I'm defending my point because I'm sure I'm, that's talking out my ass. But um, <laughs> um, what about this term then? I mean, because people Dualism. throw this around, and I think yeah, like, I think it is a little bit misunderstood. Can be has been heard um to be misunderstood and um you know i'd like to you know just clarify this for people because i think you know although it's a very simple term it it, it it does confuse i mean it's used in different ways i suppose um the, the context in which i was using it before was as a contrast to what you just uh, mentioned advaita advaita is sanskrit for not consisting of two things not two-ness non-duality um so it's just the opposite of that saying that there are two things and in, in the context in which those words are used in Vedanta philosophy, uh, one, Advaita, is the idea that there's nothing but ultimately oneness. Anything else is an illusion. Um, so the, the whole project is to not get confused by the illusion and to see all things as one. Um, therefore, to see the Atman in everybody, <laughs> to see all things as, as a, a manifestation of the totality. Um, the opposite of that is to see there's always distinction. And the reason that creeps in is because of devotional religion. Um, it's, you know, the supreme... Mm, mm mindset of the devotee i'm not the same as the divine all i can mm, do is mm. be in awe of the divine bow down mm. make offerings um, mm. so 
actually that's where the biggest distinction between the, the Vedas and the Upanishads it creeps in right in the earliest Upanishad, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. It says that people who make offerings to gods thinking they're somehow different don't understand. The truth is, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, and you can know this um, by just abandoning this idea that there's anything separate. Um, so they've, they they just pull the rug out from the whole principle of the Vedic ritual in, in their immediate statement. And non-dual religion is built out of that. It's basically saying you know, there is no religion. There's just see, seeing clearly. Um, whereas the dualistic thing says, well, the seeing clearly is to understand that there is a difference. Mm. And then there are mm. other ways in which that difference is described. And in yoga philosophy, so Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is sort of classically defined as the, the system of philosophy known as yoga, although there are many other flavors of yoga to be found in mm. Indian texts. Um, they have a different duality you know, based on the Sankhya philosophical system where um, there is pure consciousness, um, which is inactive. Um, it's just a sort of light of awareness shining. Um, and then there is the mind and the body and the world and sensory engagement between all those things, um, which comes from a, a different category. So there's a Purusha, the consciousness and the world, Prakriti, um, and they're separate. And the project of yoga is to understand their separateness. Um, you end up in the same place, really, to <laughs> philosophies of oneness in a state of pristine, you know, lacking illusions, pure consciousness. Um, but the way to get there is to separate two things in that system instead of to see them all as sort of part of the bigger picture. Um, and we mm. often see that confused in the modern yoga world because people will always say yoga means union and mm. it comes from Patanjali. And in Patanjali's text, it definitely doesn't <laughs> doesn't talk about union. It says union is the problem that yoga will resolve by separating things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would like to come to that later, I think. I mean, and probably in a further mm. talk, I hope. Um, well, first of all, I mean, let's contextualize potentially. I mean, where does he fit in the grand scope? I mean, is he drawing on past text? How did he draw on those past texts? Um, and what are the offshoots of it? Um, and, and you mentioned that, yes, I mean, there's certain things that he definitely does say and certain things he doesn't say, you know, I mean, and I think to clarify, to make that as a clear point, because, I mean, these days people are happy to decide that they potentially will say whatever they read into it, you know, which, you know, I mean, I, I actually, until uh, reading and, and interviewing, in fact, Philip Mass didn't realize that it's actually that the, the Yoga Sutras is part of a bigger work with with a commentary, basically authored by probably none other than Bachanjali himself, saying exactly what he means when he says Brahmacharya or, you know, Aparigraha, you know, um, you know, whereas latterly, I mean, I think, you know, those terms are pretty loose. We can play fast and loose with those kind of things, you know. Certainly, um, Brahmacharya. So... Nobody wants to be celibate. And, uh, no, <laughs> and, uh, no one wants to do that. Yeah, let's call it, it constancy it, or something like that. Yeah or, yeah, or or just sort of wise use of energy or some some such. Uh, yeah, not having too blah, blah. much sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just just enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't, 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 don't abuse yourself or anyone else. No. So, don't so have sex is... you don't enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a book I highly don't recommend enjoy. to anyone who really yeah. wants to take a deep dive. Um, this is you know, probably the only really easily accessible English translation of the full commentary that accompanies Patanjali Sutras by Swami uh, Hari Harananda Aranya. Um, he was a Bengali, so it's translated again into English from from, from the original Sanskrit. But uh, that's a summary of, of what the yoga sutras actually mean on their own terms. And it will surprise people who've not engaged with that before. Uh, because what's happened is that people have started reading these pithy one-liners, 195 of them, add them all together, it's barely 1,200 words. Um, so that's, yeah, that's not, not even a long newspaper article. Um, uh, and there's a huge amount of gaps in that information because there's hardly any verbs used it's a very pithy way of trying to summarize ideas um, and what we then attempted to do in the modern world is to read in our assumptions into all the gaps that are there because there you know, is a lot left unclear the commentary clarifies a lot of that um, on its own terms explaining what was going on over you know, the centuries between maybe 1600 years or so ago that the, the Yoga Sutra was composed and now um, yeah, others have added to that, always commenting on the sutras and their commentary together as if they belong together, as if they're all one thing, as you say, the Yoga Shastra, a combination of a commentary and the sutra text. Um, and uh, yeah, it's only in the last 15, oh, sorry, 150 years that people have really looked at the sutras independently. And I think that started with Vivekananda, <laughs> he mm. went to America at the end of the yeah, 19th century. Gone. He gave gave all these talks, um, very accessible, very 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 modern sounding in some ways. Um, 
but you know, basically just playing fast and loose with <laughs> what potentially says to advance his own interpretation yeah. of yoga philosophy. And everybody since him yeah, that, feels free to do the same. <laughs> that guy has a lot to answer for, doesn't he? But I mean, what was the context that they were written in? Um, um, well, in terms of, good, people good often question. say that it was a yeah. Yeah, it was an argument against Buddhism, or you know, I mean, uh, now are they are they a clear? A clear uh, do they do they constitute a clear thread in Samkhya, or are they involving other, uh, you know, other aspects of of you know Buddhism or schools, etc. Um, well, the fullest yeah. title given to the text, um, which Philip Mas has, has really emphasised, um, is it's the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, a text about yoga written by Patanjali, but it's also the Samkhya Pravachana, an explanation of Samkhya philosophy. So it's very much rooted in that dualistic Sankhya worldview. Um, but apart from that, it's basically saying very much the same thing as the Buddha. So a lot of the fourth chapter of the book is basically then given over to saying, well, we're actually saying something different, despite having you know, echoed yeah. a lot of what the Buddha had to they say. Off so the, much the, Buddhist the, stuff. The theory, but... the theory of yeah, why yeah, we do yeah. what we're doing, the, the nature of what we do, and you know, the way in which it works on the mind to remove suffering. All of that is very similar to the Buddha's message. And potentially amidst that, um, he says in the very first sutra, um, Atta Yoganushasanam, um, the Anu part of Yoganushasanam um, is referring back to previous teachings. It's basically you know, further teachings. He's providing more teachings. Um, so he's acknowledging this is sort of an update on the previous knowledge. Um, and really, I think the best way of understanding the Yoga Sutra is uh, you know, an ancient Wikipedia article. It's a bullet point summary of lots of stuff that's been known for the previous thousand years, <laughs> put together mm. in pla you know, plain language that's yeah, pretty hard to interpret, but accompanied by a commentary that makes more sense of it. And a teacher would have had to interpret that. But what is it a knowledge of? It's a knowledge of meditation. Nothing mm. to do mm. with physical yoga practice whatsoever. Um, and the other aspect of it is that it's about world renunciation. Um, mm. So it's mm. for people who choose you know, voluntarily to turn their back on the world, go and live in a cave, sit still. Uh, if you had to distill the teachings of the Yoga Sutra to a pithy phrase in itself, it would be sit down, shut up. That's it. <laughs> I, know what, I actually want to spend longer on the sutras in later.